the way we deal with nature in sport today. There are huge amounts of equipments necessary and very specific kinds of equipments. It's not possible that you just, you walk along a river on a path right. and you let it be, in, no, you have to make it into a competition. You have to have a very special, incredibly expensive bicycle and all kinds of other equipment. And then the most important thing is that you're the winner of this race. Right. But you miss actually all, you know, what I often see is when, you know, you have the speed boat and you get across the lake and maybe you're the fastest one. Well, you have to go for a while, maybe row and let the boat stop in the middle of the lake. Right. And then the fish will come closer. Yes. And then the birds will come closer. And then you will hear again. And then the symphony of nature will carry your senses to a bliss that the success of being crowned whatever it is, the king of a specific uh, right. uh, uh, competition, is ridiculous right. because it only lasts a very, very short time. And it's also extremely exclusive because everybody else is the loser. And right. sometimes you have 100,000 people, whatever, competing in, in the various stages, right, until you become you know, the national or the regional, the national, and then the international, and then right. you're the world champion. Right. And the rest is, well, I didn't make it. Right. And then what does that leave with all the ones But it's you know, more didn't serious make? than that, even than that, Max, because as long as we are in this hectic, mad desire to dominate nature, we are also involved in a death machine that is destroying nature and is actually on the verge of committing complete matricide. So slowing down, savoring, realizing we are nature and we are one with nature is not something only that will heal us, it will actually be something that will potentially save us because it will suddenly wake us up to where we are in a divine world, in a created masterpiece, in an endlessly unfolding symphony of love and tenderness and power and wisdom. And that will breed in us a sacred passion to protect the mother instead of ravaging and raping and destroying her. And unless we really listen to the voices of the great mystics and philosophers and to great poets like Hesse, who really speak of this salvific power in nature, unless we not only listen but experience this, we are going to commit mass suicide. And I think Hesse understood that very deeply because Hesse was living in a time where the first wave of romantic poets had already screamed with outrage against what was being done to nature in the name of industrial progress. He had seen Europe and America go on a long, brutal orgy of the beginnings of capitalism. Now we're living at the end of the capitalist orgy, seeing what it has actually created. And now, more than ever, we need to listen. To listen to the shamanic traditions, to listen to the great nature poets, like Wordsworth, to listen to Hesse. So let's listen to Hesse. Let's read the poem that you chose for this particular section. I want to bring a, one more thing in here, and that is we have created an artificial kind of notion of success. Oh, God. And therefore happiness. Happiness, yes. And I would love to read this poem, Happiness. Because it illustrates yes. this competitive, uh, there will be one winner and eventually each one of us could be this winner and we sacrifice all peace and all natural progression. For this illusion. Yeah, yes. for this illusion. Yes. Which is, of course, reserved for very few, you know, and essentially only for one. Yes. And who reigns then for as a sort of a pseudo king of a particular yes. skill that everybody else tears their you know, body apart for yes. and uh, is, uh, is really in a constant stress and poverty. Yes. So, and Hesse offers a different kind of idea of, ha of happiness, which I'd like to introduce. Please, and then let's have the nature poem afterwards be beautiful. Happiness. As long as you chase happiness, you are not ready to be happy, even if you owned everything. 
As long as you lament a loss, run after prices in restless races, you have not yet known peace. But when you have moved beyond desire, become a stranger to your goals and longings, and call no longer happiness by name, then your heart rises calmly above the ebb and flow of action, and peace has reached your soul. So, you know, we're not pursuing happiness, actually. We're pursued by happiness. Yes. And by a notion that is so, in a way, actually, self-condemning. Yes. With the exception of these few moments when we have defeated somebody else. It's so tragic. When happiness is actually lying in wait in every moment for you. In and, every situation, even. And that makes most games brutal elimination yes, rituals. Yes. You know, there is a team that plays against another, and they play great. And at the end, one is one point or whatever, yes, one yes. goal ahead, and the rest are going home and basically did nothing except being losers. It's tragic, and it actually offends against the deep healing rhythms of nature. That's right. That's so right. what is the nature poem? Autumn takes hold of my life. I love this poem. This is such a wise poem. Autumn rain has drenched the gray forest. A brisk morning breeze blows through the valley. The chestnuts crack hard, tumbling from the trees. They burst open, moist, brown, as if full of joy. Autumn takes hold of my life. Gales split and tear my leaves. My branches are shaking. Did I bear fruit? My flowers of love bear the fruit of suffering. My flowers of faith bear the fruit of hate. The wind rattles my brittle branches, but I laugh. I still stand strong in the storm. What do I care about bearing fruit, about achieving goals? I blossomed, and flowers were my purpose. But now I'm wilting, and now nothing but wilting is my aim. Hearts don't beat for distant goals. God lives in me, God dies in me. God suffers in my soul, that is enough purpose. Right or wrong, flower or fruit, nothing but names, is all the same. A brisk morning breeze blows through the valley. The chestnuts crack hard, tumbling from the trees. They burst open. <laughs> I, too, break open, burnished with joy. I too break open, burnished with joy, and yet he's described so much difficulty and suffering. But it's through the accepting of wilting, mm -hmm. which is part of nature. Right. So from nature you can learn both how to blossom and how to accept winter, how to accept lying fallow, how to accept all the periods of what seems so boring and so unproductive, because they are actually preparing wholly new levels of creativity.